uh, he did find it. And um, it was a really new experience for me to also be reading a book and waiting to see when my name pops up because my husband told me it's in there. <laughs> uh, so all the months that I'd spent with Jerry just flashed through my mind. And I tried to remember if I'd ever pissed him off, if I've ever upset Jerry on my exchange. I thought, no, I'm good. It's all fine. So I kept on reading and I was very reassured that Jerry and I, we had lovely catch ups. We talked about the uni demands and how to get through those. And I was very reassured. I got to a pivotal chapter of the book when Jerry talks about this international French test. And as I read on, I quickly realized I came across a chapter that I had feared. It turns out that Murray Law was not the only person that had stressed Jerry out. <laughs> Without giving anything away, I had been to blame for Jerry's torturous delay in waiting for his international French results. I was mortified. He did never turn to me, though, in blame for saying that I made him wait 10 hours to hear the results of that test. But I think Robin might have seen some of it in an earlier draft. <laughs> My favourite page is page 143, in which Jerry mentions my name on the same page as the charming professor, Monsieur William Leger. Ah. <laughs> I was pleased to see that this professor had left an impress impression on Jerry as well as myself. This novel honestly tells the best and worst parts of a language student's journey. And I'm proud to say that Jerry's video, Ma Ville La Rochelle, is with um, each, it's what I play to my students every year as a French teacher at Warners Bay High School. The book was so relatable because while Jerry was struggling to go sailing, swimming and joining the drama clubs, it paralleled my struggles to get my head around European handball, choir in French, and I believe I only survived one aerobics class in French and that proved too far out of my comfort zone. Jerry had certainly accomplished a lot in his life. He didn't need to care about the exams and the hoops that we were jumping through, but there he was, stressing alongside us and having a beer with us at the end of the day as well. He was a part of it all and just as invested as us, and he cared. Jerry is a real student of life. He loves learning for the sake of learning. I was very impressed um, that Jerry was far more invested into cleaning up his apartment at the end of the exchange and getting back his 50 euros than I was. <laughs> While Jerry was cleaning his shower drain and cleaning his walls to get back his bond, I simply said to the inspectors, take my 50 euros. I should have done that. Jerry is very well cultured, very well read, and despite his age gap, our age gap, we found a lot to talk about. He had a vast array of knowledge. He was so educated. All of these traits might seem intimidating in a person, except Jerry was humble and approachable. And it, in him, I found a confidence in this shared experience. I was in awe of how determined he was to jump out of his comfort zone and immerse himself in any new passion or interest or experience that we had possible. Robin also came to visit. As it would happen, I met Robin in a cafe in France, sharing a coffee and patisserie, and the next time I saw her, she had us over for an infamous dinner at her house. And the time after that, we bumped into each other at Bistro Moline in the Hunter Valley. Literally the table behind us. <laughs> <laughs> so what can you expect when you get your hands on this hot book right here? <laughs> a fabulously entertaining storyteller who weaves the tale of triumphs and painful pitfalls in confidence, only to allow to overcome those hurdles. The exchange experience was told in full. There are some parts which I'd actually blocked out which you helped me remember. <laughs> I learned more about La Rochelle history through reading this book. He had me in stitches also over the toilet seat chapter. <laughs> After La Rochelle, um, Jerry started writing and over time he reached uh, this point and uh, it was, sorry, revealing just enough detail and imagery and unravelling the plot twists. Jerry slowly introduces his love of all things in this book. Languages, France, the Olympic and Paralympic commentary, family, learning, literature. Cultural tidbits were interweaved. 
the rigour of the French university, the endless paperwork, which I had blocked out, I have now remembered <laughs> through reliving it in the book. Thank you for helping me remember so many of the names that I thought I'd forgotten. It was a special gift to be able to relive my exchange. I also remember the shared experience of having one mug, which became a mug for tea, for coffee, for wine, for beer, <laughs> for breakfast. The parallels between the French and Australian rugby was very special to read about because it wasn't a part of the La Rochelle life that I had experienced so much, except for one match where Jerry encouraged every Australian student to come along. It was reassuring to also know that I wasn't the only one walking up to the um, tabac or boulangerie, uh, reciting vocabulary, the gendered articles, trying to get all of the endings right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to finish with my favorite quote, which is so relatable, not only on exchange, but also in experiences when we go out of our comfort zone. Jerry says, the experience had been so much like an exam. The fears beforehand, the nerves, the false sense of security, with the pleasant opening words, the shock of reality of the task ahead, and the time taken in preparation for the test itself. But it is also the most rewarding thing to do in life to step out of your comfort zone. So cheers to Jerry in launching your book and stepping out. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, I really appreciate that, and uh, it was lovely to hear your interpretation of our wonderful shared experience. And it, it was, I'm sure you're like me. See, I'm a Rochelet, but Rebecca is a in Rochelaise. It's the difference between a male and a female. But it's a fabulous place, isn't it? And it was great to be there with you. Thank you. Um, now, I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, quite a few people have asked me over the years why I was writing about my experiences in La Rochelle and not writing about some of the great sportsmen and women that I have met, as well as the many great sporting events which I had the pleasure to experience in my long career as a sports broadcaster with the ABC. I've not counted out writing about those experiences and I have already produced one book previously, No Bull, the memoir of Australian Test cricketer Andy Bickle. I thought that tonight I could give you a taste of what life was like and why, therefore, my experience in La Rochelle had to be special to me because it followed an amazing working life. I'd wanted to be a broadcaster from a young age but was told there was no future in that and that I should make sure I got a proper education. I received that education at school and teachers' college here in Newcastle and was sent to a one-teacher school in outback New South Wales, close to Burke. While in Burke, I contracted pneumonia, and in Burke Hospital, I listened to ABC Radio's coverage of the 1970 Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh. It fired up the flame of the desire to be a broadcaster, and when the 1986 Commonwealth Games came around, also in Edinburgh, I was there as part of the ABC broadcast team, and I had the dream job of calling the swimming. During the next 30 years, I was to work at eight Commonwealth Games, six Olympics, seven World Swimming Championships, and three Rugby World Cups, on top of weekly calling rugby league and cricket, and nearly every sport you can think of. And um, as you can imagine, it was an extraordinary uh, career for a, an Australian male, and I lapped it up every moment of it. I'm going to take you back in time to my first Olympic Games in Seoul in 1988. On the first day of finals of the swimming, a young Queenslander, Duncan Armstrong, had qualified for the final of the 200 metres freestyle. He was opposed to the defending champion, Michael Gross of Germany, who held the world record, the world 400 metres world record holder, Arthur Boydat of Poland, and the American superstar, Matt Biondi, who had been predicted to win seven gold medals in Seoul. And this was his first event. In discussing the race with Norman May prior to them getting on the blocks, I suggested that Duncan Armstrong had swum impressively in the heat, but was he a chance of winning it? He ran through the achievements of the field and said Armstrong was impressive in the heat, but you'd have to rate him at about 33 to 1, given the quality of the final field. I 
We've got to need this for this. <laughs> so here's how I called the last 100 metres of that race. And Beyondi leads the way. He's really going for it, Beyondi. He might fight a tough in the last 50 metres. Armstrong is just behind him. Beyondi turns first. Holmerch is still there in second place. And Duncan Armstrong is third. Duncan Armstrong is coming with a big swim. He's catching up to Beyondi. Australia with a chance for a gold medal. It's Holmerch of Sweden and Duncan Armstrong. Duncan Armstrong is hitting the lead. There are 15 metres to go. Australia can win gold. Australia can win gold. It's Duncan Armstrong. He's got the gold medal. He'll win it. Duncan Armstrong wins gold. Gold to Australia. Fantastic. A world record as well. Duncan Armstrong, you little ripper. 147.25 and Australia wins its first gold medal of the Olympic Games. Duncan Armstrong has done it. 33 to 1. Oh, get me the money! <laughs> All of a sudden, the world went crazy. Laurie Lawrence was jumping up and down in the stands. Australians around us were going crazy. Norman and I were reviewing the amazing swim and then were told to wrap up and cross back to the studio. I was told to stay in my position, a little bit like uh, Marie Law. <laughs> Niveau B2. Um, and uh, so I had to stay in my position. I was told that um, the world today was going to be crossing straight to me and interviewing me. I remember one of the first questions. Where did you learn to call such an exciting race? I had no idea. <laughs> it just happened. It was amazing, the impact of that race on me. I had called an Olympic gold medal for Australia and I had no idea that doing so could give you the biggest buzz possible. That was the first of 23 Australian Olympic gold medal wins that I called. And so you can imagine that when I retired, I assumed that my life would be a lot different and I did not expect to have such memorable moments. Broadcasting had been one passion, learning French was another. Naturally, it wouldn't give me anything like the excitement of broadcasting, or would it? I had long dreamt of one day living in France for a period of time but I imagined a relaxed few months in a country village, soaking up the atmosphere and trying my French skills on the locals. After my visits to the Gaillard family, Cathy's host parents, I felt I needed to do something about my French, and so I enrolled in another arts degree at the University of Queensland. I enjoyed the three years of French that I did there, and so when Maui Law suggested to me that I could do a two-year diploma in languages here at the University of Newcastle, I grabbed the opportunity. Somewhere in those first few months, I heard references to an exchange program, but assumed that that would be for the young ones and that because of my age, I wouldn't be eligible. In that same year of 2012, I'd been recalled to work for ABC television to call the swimming of the London Paralympics. As I'd done so often in the past, Robin and I headed for France after the Games. I started to think about the exchange program in La Rochelle and sent a message to Murray Law asking, is it a possibility that I also could go to La Rochelle? And she replied, oui, certainement. <laughs> Suddenly, my life was changing again. It was an amazing opportunity. We changed our itinerary and headed for La Rochelle. We found, we found it a beautiful place on the Atlantic coast with no end of boats, centuries old streets of cobblestone and a significant university campus close to the centre of town. Little did I know what lay ahead of me. I wasn't only going to learn French in France, I was going to be able to do other subjects at the uni as well. I was fortunate enough to also gain a Kelvin Hartley scholarship and to help cover some of my costs. Kelvin Hartley was an extraordinary man and I would recommend reading my book, if only, to read the Kelvin Hartley story. It's amazing. This book recounts those four months of excitement, frustration, challenges, new people, speaking continually in French, getting a haircut, going to the amazing markets every day, becoming a fan of the local rugby team, Stade Rochelet, listening to French radio, making errors in speaking and listening to French, getting horrible examination nerves, enjoying taking up the challenges of making presentations in French, appreciating more outstanding teachers like Marie Law, and, and Alistair too, by the way, <laughs> um, and being accepted by numerous students a third of my age. There were highs and there were lows, but the highs may not have reached the level of calling an Olympic gold medal for Australia, 
However, a half hour chat with a local native speaker could give you a feeling of being on top of the world. And I'm sure that Rebecca and, and Andrew would know that feeling as well. I thought that I might share with you, it was going to be two, but I'll do one extract from the book, which will give you some idea of the, of the um, various emotions experienced there. And this extract is from uh, close to the front of the book and it occurred on my second day at the University of La Rochelle when I had to return to the accommodation office and report any problems with the apartment that I had just been allocated. So I'd been given an envelope and it had the form to fill in and I took the form uh, back to the Cruz office. That, uh, and um, it had been, there'd been various instructions which were placed in the envelope and I had to finalise my rental agreement. That included checking the condition of the apartment and making note of things that needed attention. That list had to be taken back to the Cruz office but I wasn't in a hurry to join that long line. However, the line was okay and I was ushered into an office to sort everything out with a pleasant woman who spoke only French, providing me with my first major language challenge at the university. I was unable to understand everything that she said, but I felt I was going quite well until I mentioned the lack of a toilet seat. She suddenly seemed to not understand me. Of course, I made numerous errors in my desperate attempt to explain. In the upper, Il n'y a pas une chaise de toilette, I blurted out, thinking that she would understand that I was saying there is no toilet seat. She shrugged her shoulders as if to say she didn't understand. I was to eventually find out that I, I had actually been saying that there was no commode chair in the apartment. It, it was obvious that I was a lot older than the other students, but was I so old that I didn't have a commode chair? Trying desperately to wend myself out of this embarrassing situation, I tried what I assumed was a direct translation of there is only a bowl. Murray Law has told you this one before. Il y a seulement un bowl, I said, only to find out that I was virtually saying there was only a patente bowl. By now, it's amazing that she wasn't under the table roaring with laughter. A toilet bowl was une cuvette. I then tried un siège de toilette, which must have been close to what I meant, that she still didn't understand, and she was, or she was giggling to herself so quietly and, and put on a good show. Obviously, I had to find my own solution. The whole experience had made me very timid when I came to the topic of toilet seats, and I thought I was sure to find one in an upmarket hardware store in the, in the town centre. I looked everywhere to no avail, only to find a woman suddenly asking if she could help me. Looking extremely embarrassed, I told her I was looking for une siège de toilette. And immediately she pointed right in front of me and said the magic word, abattant. There in front of me was a toilet seat. <laughs> if only I had researched that word before heading off for my appointment with the woman at the cruise office. After walking out the door with my abattant in a large shopping bag, I immediately ran into some of my fellow Australian students who didn't hesitate to ask, what are you bought? <laughs> oh, the embarrassment of it all. At least I was now able to enjoy the creature comforts of home from then on, whenever I went to the toilet and a new French word, abattant, was seared into my brain. <laughs> I found that when you publish a book, people want to put it into a category, memoir, travel, sport, etc. And of course there's a bit of all of that in this book. However, I felt that this book couldn't be categorised because it covers so many aspects of living. I was grateful for Scott Bevan, who's with us tonight, and great to have you here, Scott, um, for his wonderful article in Saturday's Newcastle Herald, where he described it as part memoir, part travelogue, and holy joie de vivre. <laughs> you got it, Scott. Exactly. I think that sums up because we're all able to enjoy uh, a wonderful joy of life in La Rochelle 
and uh, a very big thank you to everybody who's contributed tonight and to all of you for being here. Thank you for coming along. Um, we'll have books for sale and I'll uh, sign them as well for those who would like that. But uh, it's, it's been more than a privilege. It's just been extraordinary to have so many wonderful friends, family. You all um, have meant something to me in my life and it's great to know that you've been able to be here with me and help celebrate this. Thank you.